Okay. It's always good. It's always so, good to know who I am. It is good to know who you are. And hopefully you always know who you are. But so yes. for those of you joining, this is not live with Dr. Rob. This is live with it's ladies night again. So our clinical director, Karen Brown, um, our clinical director of the Seeking Integrity Los Angeles Treatment Program is joining me uh, tonight. Dr. Rob was, um, had, a, had something come up and needed not to be here and Karen graciously uh, stepped in. So Karen is well-versed at answering questions. Well, she's well-versed at all this clinical work and as a result, we'll be able to answer questions. And so we are going to start uh, for those of you joining us here, um, please put your questions in the Q and A, and we'll we'll continue to proceed. So, so the first question, Karen. Hello, I'm in recovery. SA. I was wondering if it is wrong of me to want to masturbate every once in a while, even though my partner and I have a pretty good sex life. Does it make me a bad person? Oh, good question. First of all, you're not a bad person. Um, there are some people that, that working with their therapist and their sponsor decide that maybe if masturbation has been a serious problem in your life, that, um, that they prefer that you are on an abstinence or plan program, um, but you're not a bad person. It's, it's what different people choose. I always tell the clients that I work with is if you're in a relationship and the other person, the partner or spouse does not agree with, has some issue around masturbation, then you two have to agree on that so that it doesn't create a disturbance or a problem within your relationship. Because if you're making a commitment that I will not masturbate, then you would be lying or lying by omission if you do. So it doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you a great person to ask the question. So I would talk with my sponsor. I talk with my therapist and um, talk with my partner and find out what their feelings are around it. Yeah, and I, um, it's really easy. And well, it was more easy for me um, before to go, I'm good or bad based on the behaviors that I did or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, and I had to really move away from that. I can make better choices. I can make, you mm -hmm. know, choices that aren't so great, but it doesn't make me good or bad. And so because that mm -hmm. moralizing was really um, detrimental to me and my recovery. So I love what Karen shared about about, you know, you're not bad and you're here asking a great question. I would mm -hmm. be curious, and I think it would be really um, helpful for you to know, because you said you've got a great sex life. So what is it that is, you know, that, that you're saying, is it for me to want to masturbate? So what is it that's making you like, are you stressed out, mm -hmm. you know, in recovery for me, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, stressed. So halts. Um, if I'm any of those things, I'm more susceptible to looking in the cupboard. I'm more susceptible to, you know, feeling um, some emotional stuff. And so, so I, I'm curious if you could kind of take a pause and mindfully look at, you know, what's going on you know, did something happen, you know, an hour ago, two days ago, you know, what has mm -hmm. been driving that? Um, Cause I have a feeling you'll start to put the pieces together and go, Oh, you know, and, and there's a better way to handle it. Particularly if you're um, if it's in your sobriety plan, if you're sponsored, mm -hmm. you know, if it's not with your partner, I mean, if, if there are things set up so that it is not a choice that you would want to make for your recovery, what are other things that would be in your outer circle, the healthy things that you can do that would alleviate or at least take down a few notches the want of masturbating? So that, that was my suggestion is like, okay, it's not good or bad, but what can you do instead, you know, that may make you feel um, uh, like it's making a better choice? Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. I'm the betrayed partner, married 40 years. Discovery oh. was June 19th, apparently of this year. I was totally blindsided and I'm experiencing betrayal trauma. Yes, you are. I thought we had a wonderful marriage with loving kids and grandkids. He gave no indication of his addiction. We both have support groups and therapists now okay. and are working on a full therapeutic disclosure in about a month. My spouse is empathetic towards me and doesn't want to lose me. His main addiction is porn and fantasy. He says he's not crossed the flesh barrier. How is it possible to trust him again with such a long history of acting out in his head? How will I know what questions are appropriate to ask about fantasy during our therapeutic disclosure? Number one, if you both have a therapist, which it sounds like you do, 
your therapist and um, it can be a seaside, it can be an ASAC, it can be different types of therapists, but your therapist needs to know what's going on for you. How safe are you? Emotionally, are you stable? What kind of questions that you, that you want to know? And that person usually works with you to get prepared for a therapeutic disclosure. The same thing with your partner is it's critical, critical, critical that there's a therapist of some type working with your partner to help that person come up with the questions to be able to give honest answers and um, to make sure that they're clear. Um, we talk about not going into to great detail about things, but to get everything out so that there's no lives left open, windows open that somebody could slip through, that, that it's wrapped up so that then when you're done, when both of you are done, that you can work toward the real healing. You've been together 40 years and it is, you deserve to have a chance to hear everything before you make a decision. Addiction to porn and fantasy um, and no flush boundaries crossed, um, you'll find out soon whether that's true or not. And um, your therapist will work with you in the healing process afterwards. Porn and fantasy is so common. It's so it's everywhere you look. It's on your phone. It's on your computer. It's on everything you do. And it's there. It's uh, kids 10 years old and older are doing it now. And um, we get calls on things like that all the time. So to fall into porn, same thing as um, I'm entertaining myself. I am um, medicating myself. I can go into a fantasy world. I can control something. I can turn a button on and I can turn it off. And that comes together and then it escalates and it feeds off itself and it gets bigger and bigger each time. So um, please seek the support of your therapist and find out what you need to do to prepare for and um, to be able to be in a good spot for that. And that he or she has the therapist to prepare so that you get the whole story and you don't have to wonder. And how long does it take afterwards? Healing takes time, but you have to trust and believe. And he or she needs to show you that they are living recovery, breathing recovery, eating recovery, and they don't want to hurt anymore. They don't want to hurt you anymore. So what do you have to that, Tammy? Yeah, I, I, and, and I, you know, I concur. I mean, that's a long time. You guys have a lot, you know, kids, yeah. grandkids, you know, you, you know, your whole, you know, hey, more of your life than not of your life you've been together. And, and it's really hard, um, I think, uh, to, to feel like, how could I have not known? Um, and so that will ultimately be part of the, how will I know how to trust? If I didn't know not to trust him here, how will I know to trust him here? Dr. Rob wrote a great book out of the doghouse and we have a mm -hmm. work group that will be starting. Don't, we haven't set a date yet, but you know, no later than January, maybe yet this, yet this fall, but, um, but you know, it will be specifically about that. We also have the couples healing from betrayal work group that just started last week. We'll start another one in January and there are specific tools, but, but even reading out of the doghouse, what I, I, you know, I heard, you know, we're both in support groups and therapists. That's, that's great. Um, and if his therapist believes he's ready for therapeutic disclosure, that's really good too, you know, because, um, uh, you know, if, if the therapist is seeing that he's able to be truthful to pull his timeline together, I mean, if he's able to do the things that he needs to do so that you guys can move to a full therapeutic mm -hmm. disclosure, you know, that, 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 that is good. As Dr. Rob says, you know, um, uh, I would not have sex with somebody I don't trust. You don't trust him yet. And it's, I think it's really hard for the guys who are caught up in fantasy because they can switch to those, you know, uh, fantasy recall. So uh, you guys, when it, the time is right, you know, navigating, how do we integrate intimacy not just sexuality but intimacy you and know in caring ways is you know is going to be you know is going to be a specific challenge you can do it and there's techniques and you know lots of uh, you know we've talked about it on webinars before so 
you aren't alone and it does take time and you guys have a long journey together. It wasn't all lies. There was a lot of, of stuff that was true. Right. You know, there's this one area that's really problematic and it feels like everything is, you know, is shaken at that time. But, but I'd love that you guys are both in, in support. You're both, mm -hmm. you know, doing that. You have a plan. And I think at some point you'll know, you'll never trust him the same way you did because you know, he can betray you. So, so that the level of trust changes, but the ability to be honest and connected in a very different and meaningful way. I mean, it, it, you don't, you don't love that you had to go through the pain to get there, you know, but I hear that regularly from couples, you know, we are connected in a deeper, more honest way than we could have been had we not struggled through this. So, and the good news is it's after discovery day, you are still moving toward completing this process of learning everything so you can move ahead and that's the most positive thing there is so yeah appreciate you. yes yeah I mean there are lots of couples that mm -hmm. you know at 40 years or not you know, you know they they can't find a way over the fracture right next question my spouse went to seeking integrity Los Angeles eight months ago he appears to have made several positive changes such as stopped a fair distance from negative friends. Two months ago, I saw he was looking at a hookup on, uh, up site. He said, no big deal. He was bored. Recently, he said he was hanging out with a friend to watch the game. I, I know he left early, but he said he didn't go anywhere else. Should I let him know that I um, drove by and know he lied? Wow. Well, I would say that um, if two months ago, you know that he was looking at a hookup site, that that could be a slip for him. And if he came from Silo, then you know that he has what's called a three circle plan. And there would be behaviors that that people can slip on. Um, I'm hoping that he is seeing a therapist his continued recovery and that he's also has a good sponsor that needs to make sure he knows what's going on here. Um, does he if you have a couples therapist and you can totally challenge, I should let you know that I drove by. You already know he's looked at something. You already know that it's been there. And I'm not sure based off the question is, did he come clean and tell you that first? Or did you happen to find out? That makes a big difference. Because um, we always say, it's Isla, tell the truth and tell it faster. You have to tell it within 24 hours. I'm hoping that you have a therapist that you can sit down and talk to and um, hopefully go through. I am concerned about this person. And I can also say that if this person ever wants to call in and talk to someone, then it would it'd be wonderful. There's a um, an alumni meeting that happens to tomorrow. be there, and in, 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 yeah, tomorrow, 10 a.m. And it would be great for him to call in and talk to see if there's anything that um, that we can direct somebody to. But please get help for you, so you're not left there hanging and wondering. You you deserve to have an answer. Yeah, and what I hear is he made some changes while he was with us. We're just the beginning. Like mm -hmm. I tell people all the time, we don't magically fix everybody while they're with us. We we we're give them tools to stop the behavior and address the underlying issues and a plan for moving forward. And that plan is comprehensive. That isn't like, oh yeah, I feel like going to your therapist once a week. Oh, go once every two weeks. It is, you know, it is specific things. You know, I'm I'm in recovery. I continue to do recovery things and I've been doing this, you know, a few 24 hours. You know, it's one of those, I don't take it for granted. What I hear is at about six months, you know, he, mm -hmm. it sounds like he kind of went, mm, or maybe he, when he got out of seeking integrity, he just didn't do the things that he needed to do. So, right. so to me, if he hasn't relapsed, he's really like, we talk about the boulder being on the top of the hill and you can stop it when it's, you know, when it's just teetering, but once it starts going, you know, th that's a problem. So I concur with Karen, get support for you. Hey, if he says it was Have no big deal, talk. huge issue. Like I right. no big deal. I was bored. It's a big deal. I'm sorry. I you're right. I betrayed you. <laughs> that was I had a slip. I need to go talk to my sponsor. I need to go talk to my therapist. I need to do 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 do. do. So um yeah, exactly. that yeah, minimizing denial mm, problem. Yeah. Okay. 
Can you talk about pro-dependence and betrayed partners? How do you support a partner who continues to gaslight you and engage in acting out behaviors in a pro-dependent way without continuing to hurt you, yourself? Pro-dependence hmm. is not- There you go, Tammy. Yeah, pro-dependence is not helping them at all costs. Pro-dependence still has healthy boundaries. You have to, as a partner, have safety. You, you I mean, that, so, so a, a pro-dependent, here's my take you can love a broken person that does not mm -hmm. mean you have to take care of that pro-dependent person that you have to believe they're gaslighting or put up with their crapola mm -hmm. it's one of those where you have healthy boundaries you can still I mean I've had a lot of partners who said I, you know, I really love you I want you to get help I can't continue to like it's too painful for me to watch you self-destruct and to ruin our relationship that's still pro-dependent that is not you know that is not codependent that is not you know not helping them that is giving them I need to take care of me you know so it is not it is not the addict at all costs it is healthy right. boundaries for your safety which also gives them something to bump up against and kind of go oh oh she's really serious she or he mm -hmm. is really serious of like oh they they are not going to engage with me when I'm you know, when I'm doing things that are problematic. So what are your and thoughts, it can, Karen? It can also mean, um, because people are, are using prodependence, because that just means, you know, the, the, there's not the, the um, you're a bad person, like it, it felt like it used to be years ago. Um, I was called codependent, and I, I didn't understand how I could be codependent. And I'm a mom, I'm a grandma. I mean, I am going to be codependent with them, but it's really pro-dependence. I love them. I want them to get help. I want them to get better. I want them to have all the things they need to have. But with your partner right now, you may have to see somebody so that you can say, I'm not doing this anymore. You need to get help. And that's holding a healthy boundary. That's loving somebody through it. It's not just throwing them out, but you are not the person that needs to continue to be betrayed and abused, and I will call it abuse, if you're being gaslighted, you you do have a right to act out on the behavior that's being thrown at you. And I suggest that you see a therapist that can help you with this, and that you're getting more gaslighted by just saying, you know, it's, no, nah, there's nothing, it's okay. No, you need help so that you can set your boundaries. You can still love a person, but you can hate what they do, but it doesn't mean you have to live with abuse every day, sometimes abuse has to stop. And when someone's acting out on you, betraying you, that's called abuse. Yeah, that's yeah. Think, yeah, yeah, and, and and I agree. I just you know like, oh, this relationship can't can't move forward because you mm -hmm. you guys are stuck. You know, if if the addict keeps gaslighting and acting out, and you keep you know, thinking you've got to try to, you can't fix somebody, mm -hmm. you know, when they're in active addiction, you can set healthy boundaries for you. And like I said, if they bump up against it, they might go, oh, these are negative consequences that I don't want. What do I need to do? And, and sometimes, you know, it is the bare minimum of checking things off, but you know what, if they're, if they start, if they just start, um, but yeah, I mean, everybody gets to choose and whether they stay in a relationship or not, I know lots of people mm -hmm. who have navigated staying in you know in relationships even when the person didn't but they had a whole support system so that the other person's behavior you know they they just didn't let it you know it, it, that didn't define mm -hmm. their world the rest of their life did so right okay hello ladies i've been a love addict since my teens being either obsessed with one person for years or stuck in a relationship uh, for years with someone I started off being obsessed with, something like that. As an older person, I feel obligatory sex as it's either been me trying to keep someone with sex or my partners putting me down for not being as into consistent regular pleasure as they are. I don't know. Any thoughts? Absolutely. Run as fast as you can and find a good therapist that you can talk to that you can go through things in your lifetime, reasons why you want to hold on to somebody, have an obsession with them. A lot of times, uh, it could be a lot of different things. If there was some type of trauma, neglect, abandonment, and, and you want to be a need to be connected. Many times we'll see that um, uh, someone is 
I'm, I may be connected with Tammy just because I'm looking to be loved. I'm looking to be seen. I'm looking to feel like I have someone inside with me and not alone. And this is something you don't have to keep doing. It's, it's an inside job. It's something that you need to work with somebody on and try to figure out where it comes from so that you can be empowered. You can make choices and not have to pick this person or do what this person says or whatever. It's time. It doesn't matter what age you are. You need the freedom and you need the support to help you. And you're not the only one. I mean, I've been there. I sought out therapists. It's, it's the way to go that helps me learn to understand me. And I have no shame in saying that to anybody. It was the best, best thing I ever did in my life quite a while ago. So uh, that's what I add to me. That is great stuff. And, and you know, I was thinking, um, uh, like, I'd be curious what happened before your teens, because I've been mm. a love addict since your teens. So mm. I bet that there's some deep wound there. And I've got two res resources for you. Um, Enid Gray wrote a book, Neglect uh. the Silent Abuser. She also did a podcast on sex, love and addiction, but you'll see those resources on sex and relationship healing.com. Um, and then the other one is Troy Love. I love his stuff oh, uh, so about attachment wounds. And I just can't help um, uh, you know, thinking that there's something there, you know, that, that makes you feel like you have to hold on to, even when you're not really into it anymore, but now you need to, you know, so, so those patterns, but, I, but, you know, I think a lot of it is identifying, you know, what's the pattern, what is it trying to, you know, what is it serving for me? Like, what am I trying to, uh, Troy Love talks about it this way, you know, it's like, okay, the betrayal wound. And then the judge comes out and goes, you'll never be enough. And you need to whatever. And you go, thank mm -hmm. you judge for doing this. I know you're trying to keep me safe, but you know, my adult brain is going to take over for this freeing. Right. That was so freeing for me to get that language and be able to identify those things. So, mm -hmm. so check both of those things out. They might be a, a starting point for you, but I agree, get a really qualified therapist. If you need help, email me, Tammy, T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. Mm -hmm. Let you know where you're located because they have to they, they people keep missing this they go oh, oh it's zoom no they are licensed therapists within their state so you zooming right. must be within their state otherwise it's it, can, it can't be therapy it, it's problematic so so please keep that in mind but i'll help you find somebody okay next question hello Dr. and just Karen. remember you are worth it yes 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 i and, said just remember you're worth it you're worth doing this and you're, you you know, you're, it's never too old. Okay, let's hear this. So, one. Next one. Hello, Dr. Karen. Really I'm recovering chem sex addict six months over. Yay. With bottom line behaviors that were illegal. I do not have a CSAT yet. I am concerned about having about confidentiality about what will be shared with friends, family, or immigration authorities or things I need to self declare on immigration forms for substance use. What will a CSAT disclose to outside without approval and when? Is there any way around it or am I just, uh, or just, wait for recovery and then visit CSAT after recovery. No. Okay. So, no, no, go ahead, Tammy. Keep going with the no. Well, so, so the only yeah. things that are reportable that, and it, it, check, check the state, but mm -hmm. um, like in California and Pennsylvania, there are um, like, yeah, the bottom line be, yeah. So, so if you, um, state and I, I, I won't get all this right, Karen, but so if you state mm -hmm. that you have um, inappropriate sex with a minor, um, you may have, we're a report, you know, if you are downloading um, uh, child porn images, mm -hmm. it's a report. So, so there are certain things that if you are stating and that's California, Pennsylvania are the two states. So th those would be reportable things, you know, so unfortunately, that's a whole nother chapter, but, you know, unfortunately you would not disclose those things, but if you're, I mean, people come to us and they've done lots of things, hired prostitutes is illegal in most States, except Nevada. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's one of those things where, you know, they are, the goal is to help you heal. The goal is not to report. So, so it, you know, on anybody, here's another thing on anybody's forms, it's going to tell you if they have to report, they're going to be really clear about what they have to report. So you would have information, you know, as you're filling out the paperwork of what that they 
can't just go running off to your friends and family. I mean, there's HIPAA that, you know, so, so uh, I think your fears of what they would share um, are overshadowing and what you really deserve to focus on is how do you heal? Chemsex, Dr. David has a chemsex group, right. on, you know, anonymous, you join, drop in on Tuesday nights on sex and relationship healing.com. Start there, you know, um, That'd be it's a great online. Place. yeah, yeah. You, you know, I mean, you, you can put up your screen name as anonymous attendee, but, um, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, everybody's in these groups are just looking to heal the same way you are. So, so, so please get the support you need because that's deadly stuff, you, you know, and I'm bet, bet, when I see chemsex, I'm always like, use that scary stuff. So, right. And just remember, there's every state is different in what, what they say is reportable or not reportable so um you need to be connected with somebody that can can look that up or give you an answer there can be anonymous calls to places and things like that to find out that information but once you're connected with the csat they are bound by unless it is reportable and they tell you that in the beginning unless something is reportable then they're bound by hipaa if it's anything else that's not reportable within the state you lived in or within the state of California, I know North Carolina has really hard rules on things and um, you just need more information, but it would help you to get help. Really, yeah. and, and I can't answer the question about, um, about immigration forms and substance use uh, through this question or anything like that. So uh, I'm sure there's an answer out there. I just don't know it. Yeah, I think you're biggest issue is mm -hmm. the chem sex and really negative consequences mm -hmm. for that. So, yeah. okay. My essay husband has had many middle circle slips and minimized or lied to, uh, to his sponsor, our marriage therapist and me for many years. Will he ever really embrace recovery? How should I handle this? I guess my question would be, I'd want to uh, ask your husband, what's going on? What is the slip? You know, we that gets asked all the time from spouses, partners, and clients. Um, one of the things that, that we do is we have a group on defining what is a slip, what is a relapse, what is going on. In a couple's aftercare session, we discuss what is a slip, what has to happen. It always means that you have listed the people you're going to tell, and a spouse or partner is told, they're asked if they want to be on that or not. Some say yes, some say no. You're told there's a slip, the sponsor is told, and the therapist is told. Key is it has to be within 24 hours. Otherwise, that window could just, oh, it's okay, I had a slip, I'll get past it. And it gets, it gets worse. So um, he's had many mental circle slips and minimized or lied. That's very concerning for his recovery because the one of the biggest areas uh, in relapse is being in relapse is lying, manipulation, and um, lying by omission. So um, I'm not sure how many that means and what the time frame is and all of that, but I would really challenge what recovery is really going on here. Yeah, think, and I'm really? yeah, like, like, this is one of those, uh, send them to seeking integrity. This is the stuff mm -hmm. that we work with. Dr. Rob often says, if the level of care isn't working, a higher level of care. So if he's hanging out in his middle circle, he's not in recovery. You know, he's still lying mm -hmm. to his sponsor. He's lying to your marriage therapist. I don't know if he's working with his, his um, does he have his own therapist? He's lying to his sponsor. I mean, I mean, I get that, you know, uh, people do that, but I'm also going, you know, I, I don't think he's really worked the steps of the program. Cause if you work the steps, things get different. You know, okay. we're seeking integrity. You know, we, that that's a, that's a key component for all of us. We, you know, living in integrity, lying to himself, to you, his sponsor and mm -hmm. everyone else. So, um, so how should you handle this? healthy boundaries for you. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's often the next time I catch you in a lie, you know, you're going to do X and, and it may be, you know, I'm, you know, I'm therapeutic separation treatment, you know, I mean, there's, there needs to be something that, that this isn't working. 
And I think, it, as I mentioned earlier, it can be, you know, I really love you. I care about us. But but the lies, I, you know, I just can't handle it. It is ruining our relationship. He, he can never start rebuilding trust. You know, the mm-hmm. clock gets reset every time you catch him in a lie. And so, so if it takes 18 months to build trust, you never get a shot at that. So, um, so I think healthy boundaries for you and up his level of care. And I think a lot of times um, not embracing recovery could be that denial that um, I don't really want to. I really enjoy what I'm doing. So I don't know. We also have, Timmy, this may be somebody that's never been in treatment of any type. He may be somebody that wants to be a part of one of the work groups to really Great see idea. where his yeah. level is. And yeah. I'm thinking that, you know, that's got to be his choice, but to be in a work group that um, he he can see because he's tried something or all these words, middle circle and essay wouldn't be on there. Um, I'm yes. not, not sure how much has been there. Yes. And the that's a great idea. I'm putting the work group. Um, we have a, um, a sex addiction 101 work group starting November 3rd. Again, uh, we mm-hmm. just had a porn addiction 101 start, but the sex addiction 101 will start again November 3rd. And we run those every month. So um, really those are good. live facilitated. They're not just watch a video or whatever. It's live facilitated. There's homework. Yeah, they are really good. Um, uh, it's not therapy. It's not treatment, but it's a psychoeducational. It's getting, um, if his three circle isn't working, you know, it needs to be tightened up, you know, so mm-hmm. um, there needs to be changes. So, okay. Next question. Hello. I've been in recovery since May last year. My wife is really bothered and I'm trying to avoid double looks, staring at women walking across the street. I'm having trouble making progress on this and it almost seems unconscious. She says I'm staring and to me it feels like a second. Could you please help with advice? Is the answer more meetings? Anytime I'm not 100% focused out in public, my eyes wander. Thank you. First of all, I really hope that you have heard the three second rule. And the three second rules is, means that one, we're human beings. And is it, we can't take men or women, whoever we're attracted to off the planet, not gonna happen. So it's, what do I do? So that if I notice, I don't stand there and keep looking. And you're being honest saying that you believe you do a second look. So the three second rule, when I word it is 1001, distract that means look away talk to somebody else say out loud okay i'm i'm looking be honest about it so that this brain can take its eyes off of what it sees before this big fantasy starts and you come from your heart and be honest with someone around you make a phone call real quick anything to pull you away from what you're distracted by looking at number two is honor yourself I am a good man. I am a good woman. I'm in recovery. I'm working really hard to do this because it's important to give yourself those kudos of you're recognizing it. You just need help on how to how to fix it. And the third part is um, this: the looks that go on or the fantasy. That's objectification. And you need to make the other person a human being. Take them out of this object world and make them a human being. Just simply... That's, that's somebody's mother or daughter, or that must be a good person. Again, not looking. It's in your brain at that point in time. And it's coming from your heart. And if you have problems doing this, um, this is why you need to see a therapist in practice, or again, some of the online meetings and things. It's too easy. If you're not calling someone or telling them what's going on, they can never know how to help you. And, um, you know, that phone gets really heavy sometimes. And so I encourage you, you're at least being honest, just being honest here, I'm, I'm doing double looks. And double looks can easily lead to fantasy and fantasy can be the fast train into relapse all over the place. So, so Scott has talked about bookending and when you're mm-hmm. going to go out, call your sponsor, let mm-hmm. them know. And then when you get back, you call your sponsor and, and you have that in your head while you're going out and about that can be really helpful because it's really fresh in your mind that, you know, I've committed to my sponsor that this is a vulnerable area for me. I'm going to work really hard at, you know, focusing on it. If you're with your wife, 
would she be thrilled if you're paying attention to her, you're talking to her, you're asking her about things, you know, and it isn't, you know, the looking away and all of that, you know, talking, you know, uh, we're going shopping together. Did you want to get a bouquet of tulips? I don't know. I'm making this up, but you know, like how can you engage with her so that she, I can only imagine how like, she's constantly on guard watching you. You're on guard thinking, oh, I have to not do this. And then I'm doing this. It's, so how un uncomfortable and unpleasant for both of you to share the space. So how can you have a different thing? Maybe there's a code word, you know, that she, that, that you guys come yeah. up with. And if she notices that, you know, that you're double taking or whatever, you know, um, uh, you know, I, there's that word is said and, and, and then you can, you can, think about it for a second and go, yeah, I think she's right. I'm going to be more intentional. So, mm -hmm. you know, like with everything, it takes practice. Um, but the, the more, the more you're focused on your wife and, you know, what you're doing, the less tempted you will be, you know, on that and the less stressful an outing, you know, um, I think would be with your wife as well. So. And I think on that one too, Tammy, the wording of it was very interesting that he apparently it was a he thought that it was just a second look. And the wife turns it and says that, you know, it was the the gazing or glaring or whatever. Um her or, or staring. She, her words are probably right. And it could be more um minimization on the gentleman's part as to how long that, that look occurs. So um, I'd have a conversation with her and be aware that she's probably more right than what you are. Yeah. And I think because we get in a trance, I mean, when people are gaming, they lose hours, you know, it's really easy to lose track of time. So, so yeah, what feels like a fleeting moment for you, you know, your wife is probably sitting there going, okay. You know, so yeah, um, I, I would just encourage you, it, it will help her the more you're connected with her. So Okay, Excellent. next question. My partner is finally trying to embrace recovery. Um, hey. Yay, porn addiction. He is, is has his own CSAT and is working hard at trying to be open and honest. He did have a slip after an extended period of sobriety a few weeks ago and for the first time ever came to me immediately wow. and disclosed his slip to me. Um, within less than a few hours of it happening, he was disclosing because he felt so sh so much shame and, and guilt. I thanked him for his honesty and transparency and told him, even though it triggered me um, and highly upset me. Um, oh, fudge. Oh, here it is. I was glad he felt safe enough to open up and tell me. My question is this. Since this happened several weeks ago, he has gone right back down the worst shame spiral ever. I feel as if he slipped back down into a lower place than he was when he disclosed his slip. The shame is killing him. It's killing me. How can, can he move past it so he can truly make some meaningful progress in his recovery so he doesn't just keep cycling through his shame over and over again? I think working with... Uh with his CSAT would be one help. I think the other thing is I would challenge and, and wonder if he's actually in a recovery group, whether it's online or in the rooms right now that's going on, because he needs to be working with some other men that are in recovery that can help support and lift him up, so to speak, and let him know he, he came and told the truth. So if that's honest, good for him, because it was a slip and he's trying to get out of the shame spiral I really think he needs to have um, some peer or some um, fellows in recovery that can help him and help him understand that, you know, you can come, you can get out of a slope. You can get out of the hole. You've got to reach your hand up and to have somebody help pull you out. So that's, that's what I would add to that too. And I would agree. And we just started a porn addiction 101 last week. There is mm. room and I, I could get him caught up if, if he hasn't already done the porn addiction 101, that would be a great place, you know, and, and, and the group, it's a small group and they could catch him up. So um, uh, reach out to me um, if that's something he would like to do, but I mm -hmm. it, Kristen um, Snowden and others have done great um, webinars on shame and how it's a useless emotion. Guilt can motivate us 
Shame mm-hmm. does not. What I heard is he did things. He did things well. He he admitted to you. Good. I heard you did things well. You thanked him for his honesty and transparency and told him I, you know, even though it was triggering, I highly upset, you, but you honored him for telling you the truth this time. So, mm-hmm. so there's more to me going on that he was so able to to, uh, you know, fall into the shame spiral. Mm-hmm. So, so getting some support, um, we have, um, oh, we had a men's group today. Uh, we have another men's group on Thursday morning, another one mm-hmm. on Friday morning. Um, uh, lots of, you know, the, 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 the Troy love stuff is on shame, you know, uh, but like there's so much talk about shame, you know, the judge keeps me in shame and the politician goes you'll never be enough and so you can't let anybody see who you really are. I mean good right. stuff to help go wait this is this is not helpful for me so there are resources I, I hope he chooses that because unfortunately when shame gets to be too much you know then full-blown relapse can happen so now is the time and he's got choices and options so hopefully he's here too so um okay let me get this done and then okay next question um, I am a female sex and love addict who has been in therapy since childhood, but never had a specialized therapist. My partner of four years is also an essay and beginning a process of healing. The closer he gets to healing as his behaviors change, the more insecure and ugly I become. I feel disillusioned and I do not trust the positive attention of intimacy. I don't like who I've become in this relationship. And I also don't feel like I like him anymore because of who he turns me into. Yet I cannot let go. How do I let go of something that is triggering me? I both acknowledge the past betrayed partner trauma I have and the direct trust breach in our relationship have an impact on my response to progress. Hmm. So female being in recovery since childhood, been in therapy since childhood. So I'm hearing that there's some past wounds that are there since childhood. Um, The concern that came up is the closer he gets to healing, as his behaviors change, the more insecure and ugly I become. Is that your opinion that you are feeling more ugly? You are feeling more insecure because he's moving toward healing um is is there a fear of i would work with my therapist on it why am i seeing myself as being more insecure more ugly um that's a deep deep wound appears to be that probably started back there when there was therapy at four years old that needs to be worked with versus growing together and being happier and sending you know, feeling like you're more connected. It seems like that one is moving forward and the other may be pulling back right now. So I really encourage you to to be working with your therapist on what's causing um, the issues that are coming about. And and I don't know how he's reacting. I mean, he could be not so happy being in recovery at this point in time. So I'm not sure. I'm, okay. Okay. Okay, so there's also been past betrayed partner trauma that that exists. I would be sitting down talking to my therapist and lay it all out there, all the fears, all the concerns, all the thoughts that I'm having, what my past trauma is, and try to start getting you support and help that you need to have and you deserve to have it because you've had things going on your whole life. Yeah. And, and I, I concur. I hear like in uh, therapy since childhood, but never with a specialized therapist. I'm going, Mm -hmm. honey, specialized therapist, you know, like you deserve it. Like this is complex trauma. I mean, this, this is, Mm -hmm. um, uh, this, this is, an intensive might be a really good fit for you. Um, Mm -hmm. I, this is please email me because I've got some ideas yeah. of, of support. Um, um, but, but it, it, it's complicated. I would, I would encourage you not to react. Um, you know, mm-hmm. in recovery, we learn, you know, you're in SLA. So, um, or you're in therapy, hopefully you're in recovery, but I would encourage you to not react, to be intentional. I'm glad you're here. Um, Mm -hmm. And I do think that there's hope and there's help. And I think we can help you find some resources that will be meaningful for you. But um, your reaction 
to mm -hmm. his healing, you know, I understand the insecure, but you know, you are not ugly. Mm -hmm. I can understand being disillusioned mm -hmm. and, you know, having all the chaos and everything. It is, it's, everything's different. Um, but, but ultimately, and regardless of whether you stay together or not, um, but, you know, ultimately you deserve the support um, to heal mm -hmm. those, those are deep wounds. So, really. Okay, this has been going on for two and one half years. We have a CSAT. I don't remember which question that was too. So yeah, I couldn't tell. But no. yeah, if there's, if it's been going on for two and a half years and you have a CSAT, this is not, if it, if it's the question, I think it might be, hmm. it's, if you only have a CSAT, I mean, a 15 minute session once a week to deal with lifetime issues, the at the end of the day, you know, the behavior is a symptom. The underlying issues are what, you know, what's really underneath all of that and addressing the, you, you, if you're going to your therapist and talking about what happened last week, you never get to that stuff. That's why, you know, our treatment program, we help people really get to those, you know, bottom line issues, not yeah. fix everything magically. And in the time the guys are with us, but have a plan, you know, identify some things. They leave lots of garbage with us. You know, the stuff that, you know, they've been carrying the, you know, the guilt, the shame, all of that, you know, they can leave it, you know, with us, we'll dispose of it. And then, you know, they have a plan for moving forward in a different way. So, and also, I don't know, sometimes when the question says, and we have a CSAT, you know, if that's, if that's like a, a marriage and family type therapist, it's a CSAT, the, the person who I, I think this is from too, Tammy, um, you may not be telling them the truth. You may be working hard to help support somebody in recovery, but you're not telling them your truth of how much you're hurting inside or what's going on. So it's, it's being honest on both parts. And a lot of times you have to have a separate therapist and then one for marriage and family therapy, you know, that you each go to together, but have a separate therapist for your own work so that you can really get to things that you're not ready to talk about in front of someone else. So. That's yeah, because a couples therapist is mm -hmm. the, the coupleship is the client, not either of you, the coupleship, the relationship is the is the client. So a good therapist has good boundaries about who the who the client is. So so it's really important that each of you have your separate. Now, sometimes your separate therapist can do conjoint therapy as a couple. Mm -hmm. You know, which is for those that do that, that works great because, you know, your therapists each know you, then they can help you interact, you know, in a different way. Otherwise, you know, uh, you know having a third mm -hmm. therapist that has the um, ability has, you know, the release assigned so that there's communication, but, you know, that's, you know, it it's more, you know, it's a treatment team. So it's like, you know, if you've got specialized cancer and you've got a whole treatment team of people working with you, that's what you're trying to create and going to one therapist for couples work when this person isn't, I think it's the right one, isn't even necessarily staying in recovery. You know, mm -hmm. the coupleship is the client, the, that person, you know, can't be working with them and giving them you know, the online assessments that would, that would not be ethical. So, okay. I'm 41 years old, female SLAA addict discovery was seven years ago with multiple online and fantasy affairs with colleagues. I moved out five years ago because he could not trust me in the past 14 months. I've finally been able to be truly sober. Yay. Yay. Last week, I found myself involved in what I call a middle circle behavior. I stopped and returned to my outer circle life and just Close this to my husband. He is so distrustful even now that he doesn't believe or trust me. We're back to square one. He says, I don't love him and never have loved him. I've been forbidden to return to my own home for the past five years. He canceled marriage counseling two years ago when I still couldn't be honest and refuses to do any work, rebuilding trust and healing the relationship. He thinks he's already done everything that is needed. I'm ready to file for divorce, so we remain good friends. Um, what would you do in my position? First of all, you have to stay in recovery. And I hate to put it as, as straight as that, but it's you have to stay in recovery to prove to somebody that you can change. And during this time frame where you've been um, in recovery and things like that is, is where did you have a sponsor? Were you working with the therapist? Were you trying to do things to change? We deal with um, 
seeking integrity, it's all male population. I've been fortunate enough that I have dealt with a full female population and full male population, and I don't do co-ed. So um, it's no different. Now, a lot of people <laughs> will object to me. When someone's in an addiction like this, there's nothing different. I mean, it's we're acting out because we're looking for or needing something to make us feel better, feel different, or medicate. So you are acting out in fantasy affairs and online with colleagues, which could be a power and control kind of thing. I don't know. You moved out, and now for 14 months until recently, you were doing better. And he's saying no. He may not want to get back together again with you. So um, I would have the discussion with your therapist, and hopefully you're seeing and um, he, y'all need to have maybe a couples counselor together, therapist, where you can sit down and go through this and really hear where he is. It, it may be that it's not a relationship that he's going to stay in and fix it. But you need to be able to find some peace together, I think, with working with the couples therapist to see if this can move forward or not. So I know that's a little harsh, Tammy, but you know, it's, um, no, I, I think it's, you're uh, spot on. And, but I also hear he canceled marriage counseling because I couldn't be honest and, you know, understandably, mm -hmm. and he refuses okay. to do any work on rebuilding trust or healing the relationship. I also mm -hmm. don't hear, I mean, again, going back to what we said and, and you kind of prove the point too, that couples therapy does not work when one person is still not, right. is still acting out. I mean, it, that, uh, uh Somebody used the analogy and I've copied it. I wish I remember where I heard it, but it's like rowing a boat with one oar. One of you, so in this case, he was mm -hmm. going to show up and you're just going to go in circles. So, so, mm -hmm. you know, doing couples therapy when the relationship is ready to do that is great. And before that, each of you having, you know, your separate support and therapy. What I don't hear is that he had any of that, that he's had. Now we right. have a men's um, betrayed partner group on Tuesday nights. We have a female uh, sex and love addict group on Tuesday nights, you know, a drop-in group. So, uh, but, you know, if he's refusing to do any of that and you are at a standstill, then yes, keep doing your recovery, keep doing what you need to do for you. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, you know, if, if there is no movement, if you guys are really stuck, you know, then it may be time to, you know, to move on in one form or another. So, but yeah, I mean, you've been out of the house five years. That, that's a long right. time in a life and to right. not have it be, you know, different. So, so that, I mean, bottom line to, to all of that also means is make sure that you have talked to a therapist and make sure that, and that, and he hopefully has, and make sure that you talk to an attorney before anyone makes a final decision. Um, and we can't advocate either way, nor would we at this right, point. Right, right. Yeah, like I said, I know people that have stayed together and live separately and, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. for financial reasons or whatever, but, you know, at some point, you know, if, if this is how things really are, you know, um, you know, both of you being able to move forward in a different path, um, and, and we hear often, I didn't have to lose my first marriage, you know, because if I just gotten the help I needed, unfortunately, not everybody chooses that, you know, or chooses to take advantage of that. So, okay, here's a, here's a question. Am I stupid for staying with my partner who continues to relapse? He just went to your program for the first time, but I feel like he's just going to relapse again, eventually anyway. And it's a big deal because his bottom line behaviors are illegal. I love him and want to support him. I actually have a CSAT of my own, but starting to feel like after five years, am I wasting my time? Everyone I talk to is negative about it. So I'm starting to feel hopeless. So so I would read pro dependence because you're not stupid. You love somebody who's very broken. Uh -huh. What I hear is, I mean, I, like he came to our program. He has a very clear relapse prevention plan. He has a very clear aftercare plan. Is he doing what he, you know, agreed to do on his aftercare plan? Because that would be different than the past five years of him just relapsing. So, mm -hmm. so, and if you're talking to everybody and it's family and friends that don't know anything about recovery and addiction, of course, they're going to support you. Of course, they're going to say, get rid of the bum and everything else. So, 
Mm -hmm. um, so, but I, you know, we say all the time on this actions, what are his actions really showing you? Of course you have fear of him relapsing again, because that's what he's been doing. But are you seeing something different? You know, is he showing up for the alumni group? Is he doing what he needs to do? You know, has he been seeing his, uh, therapist? Don't see he that. Attending yeah. the groups, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. I, and that's what I thought. What do you think? What, huh, that's what I'm thinking. What do you think, Karen? Well, and the other the other piece is it's it is not common and not uncommon. If you're seeing a therapist and he's seeing a therapist, number one, that's a big deal. If he's acting out and he's doing stuff, you know, then he he's blown away um, a lot of recovery time he could have had in a short period of time, which means he needs support and he needs it now. Um, if it's not uncommon to have a CSAT therapist talk to the partners therapist so that they could discuss what can they do? What kind of intervention can, can occur? What can we do for the next step? Is he even seeing somebody? Is he going to meetings? Does he have a sponsor? Is he looking at online meetings? There's always online meetings for everything. Does he care about being in recovery? He's got to want that more than he wants anything right now. And not knowing the story behind this, um, I would it's great that you love him and you want to support him. So pro yes. Um, but you're, you're feeling like that, that you've wasted your time. I would make sure that he's, that he is getting the help. No, it's not your job to make sure he gets the help. You can suggest what he needs to do and see his therapist and make phone calls. If he's no longer seeing a therapist, you can give Tammy a call and she'll be glad to give some recommendations for people that he can talk to, but he's going to have to make these steps to do it um, so that he if can If he left recovery. our program, he has, if he didn't have a therapist, he has a list of names because they, mm -hmm. everybody gets asked, it's on their aftercare plan. If for the mm -hmm. guys that follow their aftercare plan, they do really well. I mean, they, they, do. they do, you know, I mean, you know, th there is support at every point so that they don't have to slip and relapse, you know, but, but for the guys, I mean, we have, unfortunately, we have guys that come and kind of, you know, half do the, the program, you know, there, there are, there are people that leave our program, you know, that the clinical team tells them, you know, I'm not sure you're going to make it because, mm -hmm. you know, I don't see that you've made enough changes. There are people that get recommended for an extension that choose not to do it. You know, we do the best we can with the time we have. We give them all the resources to be, you know, successful and touch back with us. So, um, so I think, see what, what are his actions? Don't listen to the words. What are his actions? And if you are seeing that things are different, you know, cautiously watch that. Don't buy all right. in, cautiously watch that. Um, and he but, knows, he totally knows how to call in. He knows how to reach somebody if he wants help and the reminder of his bottom line behaviors are illegal. So if there has been no consequences, unfortunately, sometimes people have to wait and learn that there's consequences or they'll stay invincible until they do. So yeah. he knows how to reach out and get some help and support, um, but you can't do it for him. You can, you can suggest it, but you have to take care of you. And he does know what to do and he knows who to call. Yeah. And, and, you know, and just because he came to treatment doesn't need, mean you have to stay with him. If you have had enough, you know, it, it that's okay. You know, getting the support you need to, mm -hmm. to you know, I, I sub in on the betrayed partner groups and I've heard more than one of them say, like, I just knew that, you know, that was enough. And like, like, mm -hmm. you know, like their head might've known it, but their heart couldn't do it. And then it does. And so if that's where you're mm -hmm. at, it's okay. You know, it's, that's right. it's okay. So. And remember the alumni group, he knows what time it would be and he can get on there because it's, it's really helpful a lot of times for the guys to be honest with one another and to get some port starting there before they slip and fall all the way down. And um, I've seen it happen many times. So I would encourage that as well. Yes.
and and my clocks are chiming. It is time. I was wondering so, what that is. Okay, yeah, clocks, but, yeah there's guys. grandfather clocks over there. Yeah, there. We have lots of chiming <laughs> clocks here at my parents' house. So cool. it's all good. So, oh, so good. thank you, Karen, for joining me tonight. Thank it's you. always delightful. Thank we'll you do all. it again. So thanks That's to right. everyone for the great questions. Um, so appreciate it. Keep joining the great resources on sex and relationship healing.com and um, uh, reach out if we can be of help. See you next time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.